Good afternoon. This is Shan Dunn with Altair Global. Welcome, and thank you for attending today's webinar, the TILA RESPA Integrated Disclosure Rules, What You Need to Know. I'm very pleased to introduce our presenter, Kelly Milligan, Vice President and the Dallas Area Council for Chicago Title. Kelly has been with Chicago Title as the Dallas Area Council since 2006. After spending 15 years in private practice in civil trial law, labor relations, and transactional matters, in his position as Dallas Area Council, he serves as a valuable industry resource providing training, advice, and assistance to all manner of challenges facing realtors and those who work with them. He is also a frequent speaker on real estate, economic, and public policy issues. He's actually already done several presentations and taught a few classes on the TILA RESPA disclosure since early 2015, so he's very familiar with the topic, and we absolutely look forward to his information and his insight. So with that, it's my pleasure to get our presentation started and hand the mic over to Kelly Milligan. Kelly? Very good. Shan, uh, can I be heard? I've demuted the phone. Yes, sir. Uh, you're coming through okay. just fine to me. Okay, good. Um, first off, just a word of thanks to everybody out there, all of the Altair Global employees and all the ships at sea for taking part in today's webinar. Um, hopefully this hour is going to give you a good foundation for learning about something that's going to be kind of a protean ongoing process for a lot of us. As we talk about these new combined disclosures, uh, you know, the obvious thing is we're still sort of dealing with a little bit of the unknown. Uh, as Shan had mentioned in his introduction, I've been talking about this topic with groups of realtors and lenders and others that work in our industry now for the better part of 2015, but uh, our work on this topic actually goes back somewhat further. It's been almost two years since the uh, government announced that these rules were coming, and a lot of us in the title industry and in the mortgage industry, and certainly a lot of realtors as well, immediately chimed in and went to work doing what we could to influence the uh, the form that these rules would ultimately take, and just doing what we could to help get people up to speed and, and know the things that they need to know. This will be interesting for me today. Um, I talked about this with Shan yesterday as sort of a colloquy. In my gig with Chicago, I do a lot of speaking and teaching and training, and I would bet that in the years that I've been with the company, I've done more than 750 speeches, lectures, or presentations. But over that same time frame, I've probably done like five webinars, so it's a little bit foreign for me. And one of the things that uh, that's always a little awkward is you just don't get the immediacy of audience feedback. If I'm killing it, I have no idea. And if I'm totally bombing, I have no idea. So uh, I guess if I'm bombing, somebody just put something in the question window and let me know it's god-awful and I'll do what I can to ramp things up. But that having been said, I'm looking forward to spending the next hour kind of getting you up to speed. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what's coming this fall. Now, I'm in my late 40s, and I was married 20 years or so ago to a woman who was addicted to the Oprah show. And I remember her explaining to me this thing that Oprah was talking about called seasonal affective disorder that says certain people are just prone to be happier in certain parts of the year. I've always been an autumn guy. I love autumn because football season is firmly underway. You've got Halloween. You've got the World Series. Um, Columbus Day, not that I have any Italian heritage, but, you know, always a, a, a festive holiday. Of course, uh, depending on where you live, you get the splendor of the colors changing. We don't get that in Texas. We only have six trees where I live, and I think they're going to stay green all year round. But the big thing that's coming to brighten all of our lives this October is going to be the official implementation of the Consumer Financial Protections Bureau's new TRID rules. And, uh, you know, October becomes the critical date because, as a lot of you are well aware, the implementation on these things got pushed back. It looked like August 1 was going to be the D-Day for these new rules, and for a variety of reasons that we may touch on a little later, that got pushed back to October. So now, on October 3rd of 2015, all of us are going to get to learn something new and totally different. When we talk about what's happening on October 3rd, the thing that you need to understand is that as a practical matter, everything that we know when we talk about real estate transactions and the form in which they close is going to change pretty significantly. We are talking about the framework for closing transactions that for a lot of us is the only thing we've ever known. Now, you will occasionally work with realtors 
depending on where you are, that have been in the business a long time, but you're not going to find very many that predate RESPA and the use of the HUD-1 settlement statement, which became a requirement back in the early 1970s. So as a purely practical matter, most of the agents that you work with and that we work with don't know anything other than the current system where we get the forms that we get, we get the HUD slapped together, and everything closes in a hurry. Um, it's not uncommon in talking to realtors for them to have this situation uh, kind of play out like this. They're working on something, it could be anything, they could be out running errands, they could be playing tennis. They get the phone call from their escrow agent at like 2 or 3 o'clock in the afternoon saying, hey, look, we just got the papers in on such and such a deal. We're going to put a HUD together. We'll get it approved by the lender. And assuming that we can do that, can you have your people in at like 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock and we'll get them signed up? And in that manner, you will sometimes have closings land at the last minute and happen really very late in the day when nobody was sure whether it was going to happen or not. Well, that dynamic is done. Once these new rules take effect on October 3rd, you're never going to see anything like that happen. Uh, it's all going to be a completely different new landscape. The changes that we're getting are this. The first one that you'll notice occurs on the front end of the transaction. When a person applies for a mortgage, a borrower or a prospective home buyer applies for a mortgage, at present, they're given two forms by the lender. Within three days, they get the GFE, the good faith estimate from their lender, and then they get a document that's called the Initial Truth in Lending Disclosure. With these new rules, those two forms are going to be done away with, more or less. Uh, it's actually almost like a merger of the two forms. They'll be combined into something that will be called the loan estimate. Then the next change that you'll notice will come on the back end of the transaction. When you get the HUD-1 now, and then you get the final truth in lending disclosure as part of your closing packet, those two forms will be done away with and replaced with a new form called the closing disclosure. So instead of getting these two forms at the beginning and these two forms at the end, they'll be merged into one and one. But probably the biggest change and the thing that I think is causing the most heartache and consternation for a lot of folks in our respective industries is that you have a waiting period. These days, as we've said, you can get the HUD-1, and assuming that you can get lender approval, the deal will close that day. That isn't going to happen any longer. Under these new rules, you're going to have to wait three days. Okay. We were talking about the waiting period that will apply to transactions that are uh, closing, you know, loans originated after October 3rd. Basically, you're going to be dealing with a three-day waiting period after the closing disclosure is provided to the borrower by the lender. Um, moving on from there, these rules will apply to all loans originated after October 3rd of this year. So what that means is if your borrower or your home buyer goes in and applies for a mortgage on the last day of September, October 1, October 2, if that's possible, that loan will be governed by the current existing structures. They'll get a GFE and an initial till, they'll get a HUD and a final till, and will close using the forms that are currently being used by title companies and lenders. But if you apply for a loan on or after October 3rd, then the new rules apply. You'll get the, uh, the loan disclosure, the closing disclosure, and you'll have to have that three-day waiting period before you close. Now, to be sure, these rules won't apply to every transaction that we see, uh, although in the RELO realm, pretty much they will. But from the title company standpoint, we'll still see a few that close the old way. These new rules won't apply to reverse mortgages. They won't apply to HELOCs, home equity lines of credit. Um, mobile home loans are going to be handled a little weird. It's going to depend on how mobile the mobile home actually is. If you've got a mobile home that is on wheels and still capable of being moved, these new rules will apply to that. On the other hand, if it's a mobile home that's been jacked up on blocks and given some sort of a foundation, no longer truly mobile at that point, then, yeah, the new rules apply. And then the big exception, and it may be something that impacts all of you all, but we certainly see it, is that these new rules will not apply to any loans made by creditors who do fewer than five loans in a 12-month period. And that covers a variety of little niche transactions. If, for example, you have companies that own a few homes as investments and they sell them doing seller financing or they carry the note, as long as they don't do more than five in a 12-month period, new rules won't apply to them. The other thing that this sort of sweeps in is the family loans. You've got mom and dad who are financially comfortable. 
they decide to do a mortgage for their near-do-well son and daughter-in-law, for example. Uh, they are essentially the mortgage holder in a situation like that. As long as they don't do it five times in 12 months, new rules won't apply to them. Then obviously cash transactions will close the old way. But for a lot of the deals that you all will be helping people with, where folks are requiring a mortgage and financing, then uh, these new rules are going to apply. So let's talk a little bit about what we're getting here and why. The first question that we're often asked when we talk about these new rules is, okay, who did this to us? Who is responsible for this? And the simple answer is our good friends at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, also known as the CFPB. And if you're not in mixed company, there are a lot of other names for this organization. The CFPB is a government entity that was created by the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010, the Dodd-Frank Bill which, as a lot of you may know, is probably the largest overhaul of our financial services industry that we've ever seen in the history of the republic. To put this in a little bit of perspective, if you go back to the founding of the United States of America, prior to Dodd-Frank, there were maybe five pieces of legislation that governed our banking and financial services industry. You had the Federal Reserve Act, which was passed back in the 1700s. You had the uh, Intrastate Banking Act. You had the uh, Graham Leach Bliley Act, Glass Steagall, and Sarbanes Oxley. You take those five bills and put them together, and they total up to a little more than 200 pages. The Dodd Frank bill, on the other hand, was over 2,400 pages. And most of the people who read it and, or passed it and voted for it don't have any idea what's in it because nobody read the whole thing. Uh, to kind of compound matters, the Dodd Frank bill vests a lot of regulatory authority in the CFPB, one of the entities that it created. So you've got 2,400 pages of Dodd-Frank bill, you've got the CFPB, and the CFPB is empowered to go out and make regulations, and to date the CFPB has passed close to 15,000 pages of new regulations that govern lenders, that govern title companies, pretty much anybody involved in the financial services industry. Now, the CFPB is an independent agency. It's located within the Federal Reserve System, and it's got interim affiliation with the Treasury Department. But if you were to look at a flow chart of the government, what you'd find is that there is essentially no oversight of the CFPB. It does more or less what it wants. It isn't accountable or answerable to anybody, and that leads to some weird dynamics. There have been a couple of instances in which affected parties, chiefly lenders, have taken the CFPB to court and challenged dicta or rulings or regulations. And in a couple of cases, the banks have actually won, and the CFPB has basically acted like we don't care. They pretty much do things the way that they want to do them. Uh, prior to the elections last year, the November midterms, there was some discussion of maybe reining them in a little bit, and there was sentiment in favor of that from both parties. To date, though, nothing has happened. And now, as close as we are to a presidential election, nothing's going to happen. So CFPB is out there. You can say they've gone rogue, call it what you will, but the bottom line is they're a very powerful organization. They regulate virtually every facet of our financial services industry. They regulate bank and non-bank lenders. Certainly, that includes mortgage lenders. They've got authority over insurance companies, people who issue credit cards, payday loans, you name it. Uh, and that also encompasses kind of as a tangential matter, people who work with those entities over whom they've got direct jurisdiction. To give you an example, you have mortgage lenders who will work with title companies and realtors. The CFPB has used that as the hook to assert jurisdiction over realtors and, and over title companies. Up in Long Island, I think this has been two years or so ago now, you had a couple of brokers that had entered into affiliated business arrangement with, with mortgage companies. They wanted to uh, make it sort of one-stop shopping because the CFPB determined that these entities weren't operating in the best interests of consumers. They stepped in, fined everybody that moved, and shut the entire enterprise down. So you wouldn't necessarily think of realtors as being a group of individuals subject to CFPB jurisdiction, but the CFPB might take a very different view of it. And if they think they've got jurisdiction, they're going to act. They are one of the largest federal agencies ever created, and they've been very aggressive in carrying out their mandates. They, uh, they levy heavy fines, and as we said, they do a lot of regulation issuing. So CFPB are the folks that are, that are behind this. 
that prompts the question of why did we choose to make these particular changes? And the simple answer, if you talk to the CFPB, is this. They want to eliminate confusion on the part of consumers. Um, and hold on to that thought, that narrative, that meme, if you will. Because when you're dealing with the federal government, confusion on the part of the consumers seems to be kind of their, their reason to be for just about everything they do. The federal government seems to operate as a standing policy under the assumption that consumers really just aren't capable of figuring out what they're doing. Uh, think back, if you will, eight years or so ago to the near crash of America's financial services industry. Well, if you look at how that whole thing spun out, in the end, because we couldn't explain it easily or simply, the government chose to blame it all essentially on predatory mortgage lending. And the narrative that developed is because they were out forcing consumers to take out loans that they couldn't pay back, you know, which is always a really great business model, right? But the bottom line is because these banks were going out making people take out these bad loans that they didn't understand that it nearly tore down the entire framework of our capitalist economy. So in the years since then, since we backed away from the cliff, the federal government sort of takes this paternalistic, you don't understand and we know what's best for you attitude, and that seems to be behind an awful lot of what the CFPB has done. These particular rules, according to the fact sheet that was put out in November of 2013, are designed to eliminate confusion on the part of consumers. The government notes that currently borrowers get two forms after they apply for a mortgage. They get, as we mentioned earlier, the GFE and the Initial Truth and Lending Disclosure. And then they get two more forms of closing, the HUD-1 and the final till. According to the government, the information on these forms tends to overlap, creating confusion and leading borrowers to take out risky loans. I'm going to read a passage from the CFPB fact sheet for you. Quote, when shopping for a mortgage loan, most consumers are concerned about interest rates in their monthly payment. But consumers may underestimate that interest rates and payments can increase later on, or they may not fully understand that this possibility exists. Breaking from the quote, apparently consumers don't get that adjustable rate loans adjust. Reading back to the fact sheet, they may also not appreciate other costs that could arise later, such as prepayment penalties, the focus on short-term costs, while underestimating long-term costs may result in consumers taking out mortgage loans that are more costly than they realize. So the bottom line is because you get two forms now as opposed to one, apparently it's more information than you can process and it leads you to take out loans you can't handle and that in fact is the thing that very nearly bankrupted our entire nation. So the government is kind of continuing with the narrative that they've developed and using that as the basis for the changes that they're making. The other reason for the change, and I think these are actually some fairly sound practical reasons, is that the way transactions close right now, i.e. we don't have a waiting period right now, creates a couple of problems for borrowers. First, it doesn't allow them to shop for current rates and terms, determine which is the best loan for them, and it doesn't allow them to address last minute surprises that may happen at the closing table. Now I'll talk about each of these briefly. The whole notion of borrower shopping is another government fetish. They are under the impression that if left to their own devices, consumers would rather go out and compare eight or nine different mortgage products and see which one is the best for them. But if you talk to any lender or any realtor, and I'm sure a lot of you had this experience as well, most borrowers aren't concerned about shopping so much as they just want to get approved and get the deal closed. They're unblinkingly grateful to be approved by one lender. They're not necessarily interested in comparing what they get to the offerings of three or four other lenders. You know, a lot of them do their comparison shopping before they even call a realtor or a lender. But the government wants them to have the opportunity to shop throughout the process. And then the other thing they want, obviously, is the ability for the borrower to deal with any surprises that come up at the closing table. And we've all seen this. You guys have gotten calls on deals, I'm sure, where your relocation client is sitting at the closing table and there's something on the HUD that isn't right, well, a lot of times it's very difficult to get the lender to address that change at, in any meaningful fashion uh, and it makes it very inconvenient for our clients. So these changes to the system will hopefully make that a little more convenient. How the rules will help, according to the government, these new combined disclosures will improve consumer understanding make loan comparisons a little more straightforward, help prevent closing table surprises, 
Uh, and then really the big thing, and this is sort of the joke with the industry, is that you know, these new forms will maybe eliminate some of the confusion that happened the last time the federal government came in to redesign our forms for us. Now those of you that have been in the industry since say 2008 or 9 may remember that in 2010 the government, and this wasn't the CFPB, this was primarily HUD, came in and redesigned the good faith estimate form, uh, taking what had effectively been a shopping tool that lenders would give their clients and basically mandating that it take a particular form and basically all lenders had to use that government GFE form. And the problem with the government's GFE form is that it didn't give consumers the two most critical pieces of information that they need when they're out shopping for a mortgage. It didn't tell them, for example, their PITI payment. If you look at the GFE form that's currently in use, although mercifully it's going away, it gives you a principal interest and mortgage insurance payment, but it didn't allow for inclusion of taxes and homeowners coverage. So what would happen is a borrower would get this GFE, and absent some explanation by the lender or by their realtor, they'd look at that number and think, hey, my payment's lower than I thought it was going to be. Maybe I can afford a more expensive home, and it did lead to some confusion. The other thing missing from the GFE is calculation of cash to close. There was nothing that told the borrower what they needed to show up with. They didn't know how much to make the cashier's check for. That created some problems. Um, and, you know, a lot of people talk about what a problem that was, that these two items were missing from the form. The government even talks about what a difficulty it was, but let's not forget who designed the form in the first place. So bottom line, the government is riding to the rescue, and hopefully they're going to make things better. So that brings us to a discussion of some new terminology that you're going to have to be familiar with as you get used to these rules. In the course of the 1,800 pages that, uh, that set forth the TRID rules, there's a lot of nomenclature that doesn't make a great deal of sense. But in order to parse through it, it helps if you understand a few terms. The first thing to know is that the lender, as we've always referred to the lender, the person who is extending the mortgage loan is now referred to as the creditor. So as you're reading through guidance from the CFPB on the new TRID disclosures, you see the term creditor just mentally substitute in the term lender. The buyer or borrower debtor is now referred to as the consumer. So the consumer will be the person that we are probably working with trying to help, assuming that it's a relocation buyer. Uh, that's how the government refers to them, is as a consumer. The term business days is significant in a couple of respects, and we'll talk about that later. But understand that there is no one set definition of business days. And this is kind of a sticking point for people. You're going to see that it means one thing in one part of the TRID rules, and it means another in a second part, which can lead to some confusion. The term consummation is another new one. Uh, this is where you wish you were in the room with people because you almost always get the chuckles and the snickers. When we think of consummation, we tend to think of it in a particular context. Uh, the government has chosen to use that term for its purposes as the date on which the consumer becomes responsible for the obligation of the mortgage. Once the mortgage is funded, all the documents have been signed, we call that the consummation date. I don't know if it involves a cigarette break afterwards or violin music or anything like that, but consummation is the term the government uses, and it kind of replaces closing in, in their view. Uh, in some cases, the consummation date and the closing date will be the same. In some cases, though, it will be the next day. So be familiar with those new terms, and with that, we'll talk a little bit about the loan estimate, which is the, uh, the first new form that we need to get familiar with. Now, the loan estimate, again, as I mentioned, replaces the GFE in the initial till disclosure. The document will be prepared and provided by the lender. It has to be done no more than three days, three business days, after the receipt of an application. Now, understand that when we talk about an application for these purposes, we don't necessarily mean Mr. and Mrs. Borrower or homeowner or home buyer going into the office of their mortgage lender and sitting down and filling out a formal application. An application for purposes of these rules is the lender being given six pieces of information. And that boils down to the consumer's name, their income, their social security number, the address of the property, the property's estimated value, which for our purposes means what they're going to offer on it, what they think it's worth, and then finally, the putative loan amount. Business days, as I mentioned a little bit ago, can mean different things depending on where you are in the act. 
But for purposes of getting out the loan estimate, business days likely will not include Saturdays. And the way that the CFPB deals with this issue is they almost make it kind of a subjective, your guess is as good as mine call. Saturday might be a business day if the lender you're working with keeps all of its operations open on a Saturday. If they've got processing and underwriting working and all functions are, are still churning away on a Saturday, then that's called a business day. But for a lot of lenders, it's not going to be like that. You're going to have somebody maybe in the office taking phone calls and applications, doing a little catch-up work. The storefront may be open, but the machinery behind it may not. So in that case, Saturday won't be a business day. And I think for our purposes, we will need to assume that when we're talking about the loan estimate, Saturday's not going to be a business day. But bottom line, within three days after the application is made, but no less than seven before closing, the lender has to get the loan estimate out to the borrower. The stated goal behind the loan estimate, again, is to promote comparison shopping. The way the government sees it is that before you go to purchase a home, you're going to get a loan estimate from maybe more than one lender, maybe two or three. And if you read the loan estimate form, there's language in there telling you you're not obligated to accept the loan just because you've been given the loan estimate. It's all part of the government encouraging people to go out and shop. One of the things that has a lot of folks in our industries concerned is that when the government does this, they kind of work at cross purposes with the realtors and with the lenders themselves. Because when you fill out a contract to purchase a home, there's a closing date in there. And that closing date is the thing that everybody is looking to and depending on. We want the deal to close on that date. If you've got the government, on the other hand, telling borrowers, hey, you know, stop, smell the roses, go experience things, check with three or four more lenders, well, you may frustrate the objective of a timely closing. So what we've got to do, and we'll talk more about this later on, is encourage agents who are working with buyers to really go to the whip, ride herd on their buyers, take an active role in helping them with their financing, and make them understand they need to work quickly if they want the deal to close on time. Another little facet with these rules is that a lender can't require a borrower to give them any information, you know, essentially until they have decided that they want to go forward with the loan. So if I'm a lender, you're a borrower, you come to me, and within three days I've got to give you the loan estimate, but I can't do anything more to process the loan until you've told me that you want to move forward. Well, if that's the way it works, that's going to cause a lot of deals to stall or delay because borrowers left to their own devices won't understand that they've got to be proactive. What we are encouraging realtors to do is tell their buyers, the minute you think you've got the loan you want, start getting your information to the mortgage lender so that they can start processing and underwriting, and we know that we aren't going to wind up delayed. But uh, the government's emphasis on shopping could ultimately prove to be something of a pain. Let's look now, if we will, at the loan estimate itself. And I've done my best to give you a copy of the form that you can read here. It's a three-page document. The first thing that you see is page one, the loan estimate page. You're going to notice that it looks a lot like the GFE that we're using right now. At the top of the page, you've got kind of all the basic information, the name of the applicants, the address of the property, sale price, and just some information about the product in question. Below that, you've got the loan terms, the loan amount, the interest rate, and there's a little notation there to the right, can this amount increase after closing? And that's where you find out if you've got an adjustable rate mortgage. Here you see it's locked in at 3875, and no, it can't increase after closing. Then you get your monthly principal and interest payment, and there's an indication as to whether that can go up. Is there a balloon? Is there a prepayment penalty? And then below that, they give you projected payments in years 1 through 7 and then years 8 through 30. And of course, it's going to be the same number if you're in a fixed rate mortgage. Uh, maybe mortgage insurance goes away. But that lets the borrower know what they're going to be paying. It also gives them the taxes and insurance as estimate anyway. So you've got some idea of what your total monthly payment is going to be, and then it gives you a breakdown of your closing costs. Page 2 is where the closing costs are detailed. And here too, this is going to look a lot like the GFE that we use. The costs associated with buying the home and getting the mortgage are broken down into buckets. In A, you've got origination charges. These are charges that are paid to the lender 
And these aren't things you can shop for. These are just internal costs that are part of getting your credit or your mortgage from, you know, ABC Bank, the origination charge, the application fee, the underwriting fee. And B, you've got services that are part of the mortgage that you can't shop for. Things like the appraisal fee, the credit report fee, the flood fee, uh, tax monitoring, things like that. Those are charges where the lender has to get these things from third parties, but because they choose those vendors, the borrower who's taking out the mortgage can't shop for those services. So those are grouped in a second bucket because the lender is responsible for telling borrowers what those costs will be. Those can't increase. Those have to be the same on the final uh, closing disclosure that they are on the loan estimate. Then in C, you've got services that you can shop for, things like the pest inspection fee, the survey fee. You'll notice that the title insurance policy is included there. This is going to create some interesting scenarios. You know, it's one thing to say that title insurance is an optional fee. As a purely practical matter, if the borrower is taking out a mortgage to buy the home, title coverage is not optional. The lender is going to require them to have it. Uh, so that may lead to some disconnect. It may also lead to folks saying, well, I don't want an owner's title policy. And we're aware that in California there are some offices saying, and if they don't want the owner's title policy, we may just decide not to close them. Our industry has been working CFPB trying to get them to understand that it's not really an optional fee if we're involved in it. We'll sort of have to see how that plays out. But those fees are grouped in bucket C there, services you can shop for. Those can change a little bit. There's a 10% aggregate tolerance. So if one of those fees is a little more in the final analysis than what you see on the loan estimate, as long as the total of the charges in category C don't exceed 10% of the original loan estimate, then you're fine. And then you see on the right-hand column other costs like taxes and prepaids, shows you where the escrows go, and then it helps you calculate the cash to close. The third page of the loan estimate, as we move on, is kind of like what you'd normally see in the initial truth in lending disclosure. You get the comparisons that show you over a five-year period how much you'll have paid in principal interest in mortgage insurance, but it'll also show you how much you will have reduced the principal. And I kind of like that feature. I don't think borrowers note this where they're giving it now. But this gives you a chance as you're sitting there looking at this loan to know in a five-year period, here's how much you will have spent out of pocket, here's how much equity you will have built up. It also gives you the annual percentage rate and the total interest percentage, which is the amount of interest that you will pay over the loan as a percentage of your loan amount. Then behind that, you've got other considerations. Will there be an appraisal ordered? Can the loan be assumed? Uh, will homeowner's insurance be required? So on and so forth. So that's the loan estimate. Like I, said, I think that's one that the government got right. This is a good form. It gives consumers the information that they need. Um, you know, again, the only problem that I think a lot of us see is this continued emphasis on shopping. So with that, let's talk a little bit about the closing disclosure. Again, the closing disclosure is what we will see as we get close to the end of the transaction. This is a document that can be prepared and provided by the lender or by the title company. The regulations leave it up to the lender to determine what they want to do. They can let the title company prepare it or they can do it themselves. But here's the thing. When you read the CFPB's regulations and guidance, they're very explicit in telling us that lenders will be held responsible for the failure of any of their service providers to follow the requirements of the CFPB. And the penalties for noncompliance can be pretty stiff. Just a simple, oops, I didn't mean to screw up, could be $5,000 a day. If it's gross negligence, you're looking at $25,000. And if it's an intentional violation, you're looking at a cool million. If I'm a lender and I know that I am trusting a title company that I may not know real well to prepare this closing disclosure and they get it wrong, it could wind up costing me six figures if not more, that's going to make me nervous. And so what you're seeing is a lot of the lenders, certainly a lot of the big national lenders, are saying that they are going to go ahead and prepare the closing disclosures themselves. Depending on where you are in the country, you may see smaller regional lenders that actually will let title companies do this for them, but the trend, the overwhelming trend seems to be that lenders are going to be the ones that prepare these closing disclosures. And that brings to mind uh, an interesting point related to the delay in the implementation deadline. One of the biggest concerns that everybody has had with the implementation of these new rules is the CFPB's seeming refusal to grant anybody a grace period. You know, at first the rules were going to take effect on August 1st, 
realtors, lenders, title companies were all asking the government, if we screw this up, you're telling us you're going to go ahead and enforce this as though we've been doing it for years. You're not going to give us 60 or 90 days to kind of figure it out. And the government's attitude was, uh, we'll think about it, but probably not. One of the things that is being talked about now, not only will the rules go into effect on October 3rd, giving us essentially a two-month delay, but there is sentiment toward the CFPB not pursuing any enforcement actions for noncompliance or violations or just screw-ups until February of 2016. The idea being that everybody will have a chance to work a few of these, and it's understood that we may make a mistake once or twice, but hopefully it'll be kind of a no-harm, no-foul situation. That hasn't been decided yet. That's going to be sort of a watch-the-space item, but there does seem to be a lot of sentiment in favor of that. Bottom line, because the lender is responsible if the title company messes something up, most lenders are going to be doing their own closing disclosure. At that, let's talk a little bit about what the closing disclosure does and what it looks like. Okay, there you see the closing disclosure. This is a four-page document, and if you look at page one, you will notice that it is very, very similar, indeed almost identical to page one of the loan estimate. The reason being the government wants you to be able to put those two page ones kind of side by side and compare them. Is the loan amount the same as we were told? Is the interest rate the same? Will the payments be the same in years 1 through 7 and years 8 through 30? Uh, taxes and assessments, so on and so forth. So page 1 of the closing disclosure, page 1 of the loan estimate, for all intents and purposes, are pretty much the same thing. Page 2 starts to look a little more like another document that we're familiar with, that being the HUD-1 settlement statement. You'll see the loan costs broken down as we talked about with the loan estimate in buckets. You've got the origination charges in A, services for which the borrower cannot shop in B, services that the borrower did shop for in C, and then total loan costs. Now, one thing that is going to be interesting about this new form, if you look at HUD-1s, you'll notice that they are numbered. All of the lines have a certain number. And over time, we become familiar with those numbers and what they mean. We know what a 702 charge is, for example. We understand that certain items go in a certain numbered line. With these new forms, we don't have numbering. The charges are to be entered into those individual buckets alphabetically, which is probably fine, but at least initially the concern a lot of folks have is some lenders have different names for certain sorts of charges. Some title companies in certain parts of the country may refer to charges differently. So there's a concern that we won't all be speaking the same language and that it may lead to some confusion. The gentlemen at the National Real Estate Post tell us that there are now a cottage industry of companies that are springing up to sort of facilitate communication between lenders and title companies. But, uh, uh, you know, that might have been one where if they'd left the numbers, we'd be better off. But this is just one more thing we'll have to get used to. But as you see on page two, you get a breakdown of the closing costs. That brings us then to page three and four of the closing disclosure. As we look at the closing disclosure, page three, you get the top of that, the, uh, the calculation of cash to close, and then below that, the summary of transaction. It sort of gives you the snapshot from both sides. Now, in this version, you'll see the borrower's information and the seller's information on the same form. I don't know how often we're going to see that in the real world, one of the reasons being is that the lender can't share the borrower's information with just anybody unless and until they have authorization. And of course, we know from working transactions using a HUD, it's not uncommon for the seller to sign a settlement statement where the borrower's numbers are blanked out and vice versa. But if it were all on one form, this is what it would look like. And then on page four, you've got the additional information about the loan, whether it's assumable, is there a demand feature, and this is, again, the same sort of information that you see on the final truth in lending disclosure. Um, and these forms are available if you want to pull copies that you can study in more detail by going to the CFPB's website. They've got them there for you. But that's essentially what the closing disclosure will look like. Now, there are a few issues with the closing disclosure that we need to discuss. The first is the timing for delivery of the closing disclosure. The disclosure must be given to the consumer, as we noted earlier, three business days before consummation or, for our purposes, closing. So bottom line, lender gets the closing disclosure to the borrower. We sit and wait for three days before anybody can go sign papers and move into the home. 
the business days in this case will include Saturdays. They just won't include Sundays or legal holidays. So on the one hand, you've got a little confusion here. We've got two different definitions of business days, but the way that it plays out actually works in our favor. Since Saturday is a business day, it'll help kind of expedite. Those three days, if you're over a weekend, will run a little more quickly. The Sunday won't count, but the Saturday will. Uh, but the additional wrinkle is this. The amount of time between delivery and closing is going to vary depending on how the lender makes delivery. If the lender gives you the closing disclosure face-to-face, -face, I mean, they literally hand it to you, then you know that it's been delivered. The three-day waiting period starts right there. But what if you're working with a lender in another city or in another state, and they choose to deliver the closing disclosure by mail or email? Well, in this case, the government gives them a three-day delivery period and then a three-day waiting period. So if I'm Johnny at Whamco Lending and I'm sticking a closing disclosure in the mail, it's going to be six days after the thing is postmarked before anybody can close anything. And what's also perhaps a little anomalous is even if it's emailed, which would we seemingly result in an instant transmission, there's that three-day delivery period. How are we going to work with this? Well, the CFPB has said when the borrower receives a closing disclosure, if it was you know, quicker than three days, maybe it was emailed and received that same day, if the borrower notifies the lender at that time, yes, I have your closing disclosure, I am acknowledging receipt, then that might vitiate the three-day delivery period somewhat. That could be deemed the day of delivery, and it'll just be three days. But what I think you're going to find is a lot of lenders are going to err on the side of being careful and conservative, particularly as we all try to get our arms around these rules. And what you're likely going to see is a lot of lenders making everybody wait six days as opposed to three days. This will be an opportunity for some of the more service-oriented, smaller regional lenders. And I'm already hearing this talk in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Some of the smaller regional banks are going to be willing to go the extra mile and make sure that they can get loan or closing disclosures delivered by hand, in person, face to face, so that it won't be six days, so that it will be three. But the timing on delivery of the closing disclosure is something of an issue, and it's one of those things that we'll all have to look at. And I believe our next slide shows you kind of a timeline as to how this works. Uh, if you look at it, you can kind of read it for yourself, but you see there in those, that top group of numbers, starting on Monday the 2nd, you have a three-day delivery period. So if the closing disclosure is delivered not by hand, but by mail or email, we go three days waiting period for delivery, then a three-day waiting period before the closing occurs. So if it's stuck in the mail or emailed on Monday, Thursday is deemed to be the date of delivery. We wait three days. Sunday doesn't count. The following Monday, the ninth in this case, is the first day that signing or closing can occur. Uh, and then obviously with a lot of refinances, you've got a right of rescission. Disbursement can't occur until Friday. It's just a purchase then the ninth is going to be your consummation. There won't be any right of rescission there. But this little chart gives you an example of how closing can work relative to delivery of the closing disclosure. Now, the big question we get when it comes to the closing disclosure is, what happens if something needs to change? I get my closing disclosure, and I see something is amiss. What can we do about that? Initially, when the CFPB issued these rules, the, the first drafts of them and the first position papers, the CFPB took the position that if anything changed tough, you were going to have to redisclose and wait another three days. This was met with an outcry from absolutely everybody. The Mortgage Bankers Association didn't have good things to say about this. Lawrence Yoon and the folks at National Association of Realtors, and certainly the title industry's lobbyists were, were all very busy explaining to the government what kind of a train wreck this would cause. So as a result of our lobbying efforts, and it was very much a combined front, we got it softened a little bit. Now the closing disclosure can be changed without triggering another three-day waiting period unless the change in question affects the APR by an eighth of a point or more either way. If when the numbers come out on the closing disclosure and we need to make a change, the result of that change will swing the, uh, the APR, then we need to redisclose and wait another three days because we aren't talking about the same loan. It's materially different in the government's view. The second situation is if the change involves a new product or program by the creditor, I don't know how often this is going to happen, but you do sometimes see it. 
you have a borrower who applies for a mortgage and it turns out once it's gone through underwriting or processing that they just can't get approved that way. Normally how you see it is somebody will go conventional, there may be something that can't be cleared up and so the lender says, I can't do it this way, but I can take the FHA. Well, if the lender can take them FHA, great, that's all fine and good, but that's a totally different product and so we'll have to have another redisclosure, another three-day waiting period. That makes sense to me. And then the third situation, is if the lender decides at the last minute to add a prepayment penalty, we'll have another three-day waiting period. And I'll bet everybody out there knows the answer to this. Talk to lenders and they make it pretty clear. We just aren't going to be adding prepayment penalties late in the game. But for any other change that has to be made to the closing disclosure, we won't need to wait three days. We can provide a corrected closing disclosure, and that can be signed by the borrower at closing. Um, and again, I can't emphasize enough, this is a big break for the industry because what the industry originally was going to get was a three-day waiting period for just about any change that you can imagine. So closing disclosure can change. Now, there are some other issues relating to the closing disclosure that we need to talk about. We know that it can change, but if that's going to happen, well, who prepares the new closing disclosure? The regulations don't tell us, but it will obviously be the lender's responsibility to make sure that it's done properly which leads us all to believe that the lenders initially will be the ones that do the new closing disclosures if there needs to be a change made. Now, I'm of the opinion, having watched the way these things play out, that as I said a little bit ago, we're going to see everybody play it very close to the vest, be very conservative when these rules first take effect. But over time, when we see what the CFPB considers to be enforcement priorities, we may see people loosen up a little. And my guess is on closing disclosures, if they need to be corrected or changed, unless it's really significant or really big changes, we may get to the point within a few months or a year or two where lenders will let title companies prepare the revised closing disclosure with some degree of supervision and blessing. But at least initially, look for the lenders to be the ones who will do that. Second issue with the closing disclosure, the lender isn't allowed to share the information in the disclosure with anybody other than their borrower because it's considered confidential information relating to their finances. The problem there is if it only goes to the borrower, what about the realtor and the broker? What about the title company? What about all these other entities or individuals that need to know what's in it for purposes of closing a transaction? The form itself doesn't allow disclosure outside of the borrower. What's being done in response in a lot of states is the regulatory agencies that govern realtors, you know, or the association, for example, in Texas, the Texas Association of Realtors put together a form authorizing the lender to disperse to everyone who needs to know it. It's a form that is given to the lender by the borrower, and that allows the lender, in effect, to communicate the closing disclosure to the broker slash realtor, to the title company, so on and so forth. And, you know, if you're not in Texas, obviously other states will be taking similar steps. And that's kind of uh, the MO in a lot of places around the country. Now that we kind of have a sense of what these regulations look like, agencies are anticipating problems, and this implementation delay is giving people an extra 60 days to try to wire around it. But the form that I mentioned put out by TAR, just an example of that. Uh, it's one of those things that we're doing, working on now that we know. Third issue, let's talk about what happens in a specific situation that might change the closing disclosure. I've got my closing disclosure. We're ready to close. I'm the borrower. I do a walkthrough on what will soon be my new house, and I see that in moving out, the sellers maybe gouged a wall or scraped the paint in one room, and I want that to be fixed, and I'm entitled to have that fixed. A situation like that, probably won't be very expensive to repair a remedy. You may be looking at a $200 or $300 credit to the buyer. And in a situation like that, the resulting buyer credit likely isn't going to swing the APR much. The overall change won't be an eighth of a point. So in a situation like that, you should be able to issue a corrected closing disclosure reflecting the credit to the buyer and sign it at closing and everybody will be fine. But what if you've got a somewhat more, uh, more ominous situation? The seller proceeds under the mistaken assumption that they get to take all of the kitchen appliances with them. The buyer was counting on the kitchen appliances being left behind. And I don't know how it's done in the state where you live. In, in most Texas transactions, everybody's going to leave the stove and the refrigerator. 
But if the seller should decide to take them with him, all of a sudden the buyers bought a home, they don't have appliances, that's got to get fixed. There's an example of a situation where the resulting credit to the buyer very well may swing the APA, APR by more than an eighth of a point. So we may be looking at a new disclosure and a new three-day waiting period. Simple answer there is listing agents need to be very clear with their sellers. If you didn't exclude it, then it stays here. Don't take it because if you do, it could wind up jeopardizing your transaction, delaying the closing. And you know, if the seller's got to sell and close to buy, it could cause them problems too. Um, fourth point, a lot of lenders are suggesting that parties complete the walkthroughs at least seven days before closing just to avoid the surprises occasioned by these kinds of situations. And if I, if I were here live, I'm sure I'd hear some chuckling because most people who work with realtors know getting a walkthrough done the day before closing can sometimes be more problematic than you'd believe. The notion of getting it done seven days early, uh, that's going to be Herculean. I don't think you're going to see that very often. Now, here again, one of the things that we have seen, at least in Texas, and I think this extrapolates to other states, uh, the broker lawyer committee here in Texas that puts together the forms that realtors use on their transactions is amending the contract to allow for a three-day extension of the closing date in the event that the deal does not close on time because of a three-day redisclosure. So I'm the borrower, I'm buying a home, my assumption is that I'm going to close on August 15, but we have to have a redisclosure and a new three-day waiting period, and as a result of that, I'm in default because I haven't closed by the agreed closing date. Well, if the reason for the default is because the lender is required to redisclose and we have to wait three more days, there'll be, in all likelihood, an automatic extension. And I'm sure other states will make similar sorts of adjustments. But absent something like that, there are dangerous situations out there. If you've got a buyer that doesn't have their ducks in a row or a buyer's lender who doesn't, and the buyer just flat out misses the closing date, technically speaking, they're in default. And depending on how the contracts are written in your state, that may leave the seller the remedy of terminating the contract, saying, forget it, you didn't close on time, we're done with you, and moving on to another buyer. We see that a lot, in, particularly in some of the higher priced zones in the Dallas Metroplex. You'll have sellers who are under contract, but just to be safe, they may take a backup contract, somebody to whom they can turn if the primary contract falls through or doesn't close on time. And we have seen transactions where the buyer who is contracted to purchase the home is unable to close by the date to which everybody has agreed, and sellers in some cases are being very brazen and aggressive, either terminating and kicking that buyer to the curb, moving to their backup, or demanding premiums from them not to terminate the contract. So uh, there's an issue that I think we all need to be prepared for. The best answer I can give anybody is if you're working on the buyer side, encourage people to get their loans processed and underwritten as quickly as possible. Don't shop, just get approved. And if you're working with listing agents, encourage them to show a little grace for buyers in this situation. Everybody is going to be working without uh, a net for the first few months of this. Until we know how it works, we're going to see transactions bust. You may be thinking as a seller, I can kick these people to the curb and move on to the backup. But speaking practically, you could move to the backup and they could have the very same problem. So you could be facing this same situation 30 days hence, and it doesn't do you any good to move to the second contract. Just encourage everybody to show a little bit of grace. So. Those are some concerns we have with the closing disclosure. Beyond that, there are some legal concerns. Because of the way the form reads, there's certain information that isn't being communicated the way we're used to doing it. An example is the way that the lender's title policy is frequently calculated. Uh, in 26 of the 50 states, if a person is buying a home and buying an owner's title policy and there's a mortgage involved, the lender's title policy will be discounted because of simultaneous issue. I don't pay the full title premium twice, I get a discount on the lender's policy, which saves me a little bit of money. Well, the CFPB does not allow us to show the way the rate is calculated. We have to show it in kind of an unwieldy manner. It's sort of like some of that common core math that you see people posting about on Facebook. We have to show a very counterintuitive calculation process 
which we know is not going to make a lot of sense to borrowers. We're going to have problems in Texas and in 25 other states. The answer is that our forms here are going to be revised by the TDI or the Texas Land Title Association to kind of give borrowers an explanation as to how the rate is calculated. Um, another problem that we're seeing, not just in Texas but elsewhere, there are certain disclosures that may be required by state law as to how the title premium is determined. You can't put that anywhere in the closing disclosure. The CFPB won't let you. So that's going to be another form that will go to the borrower to give them information that we used to be able to provide before. Um, as mentioned, the closing disclosure also doesn't allow the escrow agent to disperse based on the numbers that are set forth. One of the nice things about the HUD is once it's been signed by all parties, it pretty much authorizes the escrow agent to close and fund, and we can disperse based on the numbers that are in there. Can't do that with the new CFPB closing disclosure. So as a result, state agencies are crafting documents that will resolve this issue as well. The end result, when you look at it, is if you're thinking that all of these new changes were going to mean less paper and less confusion, uh, the answer is think again. The government thinks they're saving you a little wear and tear by merging two forms into one, but because of the nature of the forms, we're probably going to wind up with four or five other pieces of paper being thrown at them. Bottom line, it may wind up uh, completely different than what the government had in mind. So uh, these are just some of the things that we'll have to get our arms around. How is this going to impact us? as industries, as realtors, as title companies, well, obviously the lender is taking away a big chunk of our work in doing the closing disclosure for borrowers, but you're still going to need the title company because obviously we're going to be the ones to administer the contract while everybody is working through the title and escrow process. We're going to be providing the title commitment and all of the pertinent documents, so we'll still have a huge role, and we're still going to have to do the closing disclosure for the seller. So. The title company doesn't go away or become less important, and I think from a RELO perspective, maybe we become more important. I think this is probably where, particularly early on, you're going to want to cleave closely to your network partners who get what we're doing, but also understand the nature of the benefits that you provide. You've got two things that you'll be fighting as these new rules take effect. First, you're going to want to make sure you're working with a title company that understands them and gets them, but that's only half the battle. A title company that gets these new changes but doesn't understand what you do and what you bring and what you provide, what your procedures are, is prone to make mistakes on these documents, and you want to avoid that. So still going to be very important for you to work with one of your partners, as, as outlined by the company. Um, next point, because lenders are, as we talked about earlier, responsible for the failure of any of their service providers to follow CFPB rules. Most of the lenders are going through a real vetting process with title companies all around the country. They're wanting to make sure that our people are properly registered and certified, that we have E&O coverage in place, that we meet certain information security protocols, because those are rules that we've all got to follow. The title company screws up, the lender's responsible. So the lender wants to make sure that the title company does everything the way CFPB would have you doing it. What this could ultimately mean is a real contraction in the title industry. You won't maybe see it as keenly in large marketplaces. Take, for example, the Dallas-Fort Worth metro area. You've got a million title companies, many of whom are part of larger corporate structures. Uh, for example, Fidelity National Title has several different brands. They're all represented in the various marketplaces in Texas. But then you get out into the rural counties, and, you know, you may not have a Chicago title or a Fidelity National title office. In a lot of those counties, what you may have is just a law firm that closes transactions as an agency shop and then issues somebody's paper once the deal is closed. Well, they're all going to have to be vetted by the lender as well. Some of them, quite candidly, are just going to decide it isn't worth the money spent to ensure compliance, and it may really limit consumers' options for title and escrow services. And, you know, depending on how you sit, it may not be that big of a deal. It would be easy, I think, for any of us with the Fidelity family to, to find ourselves being cavalier about it because we're not likely to be affected by this. But I do think in the end, to the extent that it limits choice, that seems like it's at cross purposes with what the government wants. Bottom line, it may have more of an impact on small title companies than anybody. Beyond that, though, 
we've got to ask the question, the more important question, of what do we do with all of this? I mean, it's one thing to talk about how it impacts the industry. How does it impact those of us that are in the trenches working transactions? Well, several points to consider. First thing is this. Everything is going to have to happen fast because buyers are being encouraged to shop and take their time, and they can't be required to give information to the lenders. If left to their own devices, they could end up blowing closing deadlines, as we've talked about. So buyers and their agents need to understand the importance of working with a sense of urgency. Get information to the lender sooner rather than later. Don't wait just because the government tells you you can. If you want to close on time, you need to work quickly. Agents, for that same reason, will need to assert control over their buyer's financing. You see in the current regime deals that end up closing late because the borrower is shopping on the Internet two days before closing. They find some Internet lender that can save them a sixteenth of a point, and in the end, it doesn't work out to be a savings. It just frustrates everybody. But uh, borrowers need to be discouraged from playing those games and maybe up to the agents to make sure that they don't go there. Agents will have to learn the forms, obviously. Uh, and all of you in relocation companies will need to understand them as well because they're going to come to you with questions just as they come to me. You'll want to be able to explain what the forms mean and how certain items on them can change. The biggest practical difference that I think a lot of us are going to notice is closing times for financed transactions. If you're doing this with cash, all the old rules apply. It can close just like the deals we work now. You might see things close in 10 or 15 days, maybe less if it's really clean. But for a finance transaction with a mortgage, 30 days is kind of the norm in Texas. We're telling agents, you probably better count on 45 and maybe 60. Now, that said, there are lenders in our marketplace telling people, hey, no problem. We can do this in 30 for you still. But that assumes that the borrower is cooperating fully and being proactive. I think if you are looking at the date to write in on a contract for the closing, you need to plan on 45 to 60 days. Um, and this will probably change once we get comfortable with it, but it's, it's going to take some time before we get there. Allow yourself time for the process to work. Listing agents, as I've talked about, need to be reasonable with this, uh, set reasonable expectations rather for sellers. If the deal busts because the borrower is a day or two late, we need to be willing to show that borrower a little grace. And everybody probably needs to learn to work temporary leases because we don't know when deals are going to close or if they're going to close. What you will see are situations where listing agents tell their clients, don't pack and move until this deal is done. And the reason is because a good listing agent, as you know, doesn't want to have to sell a vacant house with no furniture in it. That's harder to do. So more and more of them are telling people, be ready to move quickly, but don't do anything until after this deal is closed and funded, which means everybody on both sides are going to need to be familiar with temporary leases because we're going to see more and more of those. So it all sounds like quite a mess, doesn't it? It does lead people to ask, how are we ever going to survive this? How are we going to get through this? What I've told people is it's not the end of the world. This is like every other change we've seen. It's going to be weird at first, but we will adapt and we will get used to it. October will probably be a fairly easy month for us because by then, we're not really in the busy season anymore. We're sort of in the start of the fourth quarter slowdown. But keep in mind, since these rules will only apply to transactions originated after October 3rd, most of what we do in the month of October is going to be closing out the stuff on our pipeline that came before, the August and September deals that are governed by the old rules. When we get to November and the new transactions start hitting, that's when it's going to be weird. But November and December typically aren't as busy, so the hope is that we'll all have a little more time and opportunity to give each individual deal more consideration, thus reducing the risk of mistakes. And so in that sense, the delay in implementation should help everybody to get used to it. In the meantime, state agencies all around the country are preparing forms and fixes and hacks that will allow realtors and lenders and title companies to solve or address some of the problems that we know these forms are going to cause. The bottom line, this is true for realtors, it's true for relocation. You want to be working with people who understand these changes as well as you do and who know how to guide you and how to advise you. You've got lots of options out there. There are plenty of realtors out there that could wind up working a contract through or with your company. Uh, but you, I think, want to make sure that these are people that you know and trust, people who stay abreast of changes in the industry. Same thing, really, for title companies. Just as long as you're working with good business partners, you all ought to be okay. 
I would close with just a few very simple thoughts that to me sort of encapsulate this entire matter. We have big changes coming, and I know it makes a lot of us nervous. You can fear change, or you can embrace change, but we know we're not going to stop it. So what we've got to do is adapt and overcome, and what I'm referring to specifically here is the manner in which a lot of folks in the mortgage and title industries have gone about explaining these changes to people. In some cases, it's just fear-mongering. It amounts to nothing more than we're the only ones that understand this, and if you don't close with us, everything is going to blow up and go to hell. And I don't know that that's really doing anybody a service. I think we all need to step back, take a deep breath, do as much as we can to prepare for the change, but make no mistake, it's coming. So we need to meet it. We need to meet it with a positive attitude, do everything we can to prepare for it, and understand that there will be some bumps in the road. But if we weather it in good spirits, we're going to be fine. And if I were on the phone talking to any or all of you a year from now, what I think we'll find is that we're all cool with this. These are some good changes. The three-day waiting period is really the curveball, but the new forms are going to be a positive. And once we've gotten used to this, I think what we'll see is a system that is truly better for the consumer. And that's really all I've got, so I'll turn it back over to Shan. All right. Thanks a lot, Kelly. Well, everybody, we've gone over our allotted hour. So uh, I want to thank you for sticking with us and also apologize for taking a little bit more of your time than we had originally intended. Uh, but it was all great information, so thank you to Kelly for compiling it and presenting it. Uh, here is the continuing education instructions, and these will be available in the handout you received before the webinar as well. And I'd just like to thank everyone for their time, for their attendance, and don't worry, we will be monitoring the questions, and they will be recorded and go to webinar. And we will definitely get those to Kelly and get the questions we couldn't answer today sent out to everybody. So thank you, everyone, for their time, their attendance, and have a wonderful afternoon. Goodbye.